On December 13, 1937, the Japanese Imperial Army captured the Chinese city of Nanking, now known as Nanjing, where the death toll was estimated to be around 200,000. During this time, the world was gripped by the turmoil of the Second Sino-Japanese War. What followed was a period of unfathomable horror. As the invading forces took control, a wave of unspeakable atrocities swept through the city. Civilians were subjected to unimaginable suffering, and the world looked on as humanity seemingly lost its way. The Second Sino-Japanese War, also known as the War of Resistance Against Japan, was a conflict that began on July 7, 1937, and lasted until September 2, 1945. It was a major theater of World War II and primarily involved China and Japan. The Mukden Incident, occurring in 1931, marked the beginning of Japan's expansionist ambitions in China. It involved a staged explosion near a Japanese-owned railway in Mukden, now Xinjiang, which Japan used as a pretext to occupy Manchuria. This event led to the establishment of the puppet state of Manchukuo and had significant implications for regional stability and international relations. Before reaching Nanking, the Japanese engaged in a brutal battle for Shanghai, causing significant casualties on both sides. The Chinese forces were eventually forced to retreat and the city fell to the Japanese in November 1937. Following the fall of Shanghai, the Japanese set their sights on Nanking. The Chinese nationalist government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, decided to relocate its capital to Chongqing to avoid the impending confrontation. Despite initial setbacks, Chinese resistance stiffened and various Chinese factions united against the common enemy. The nationalist government formed a fragile alliance with the communist forces, led by Mao Zedong, to fight against the Japanese. With their backs against the wall, Chiang Kai-shek ordered to withdraw of almost all official Chinese troops from Nanking. Untrained auxiliary soldiers were left behind to hold the city at all costs. In a haste decision, he also forbid the evacuation of Chinese citizens and set up a safety zone that consisted of small refugee camps. However, the respect for these safety zones were soon dismantled under the orders of General Iwani Matsui, the leader of the Japanese Imperial Army. A policy for the Japanese Imperial soldiers was laid down to be followed, which was known to be the burn to ash policy or the three alls policy, which aimed to undermine and suppress Chinese resistance by employing three key principles, kill all, burn all, loot all. The kill all policy. Under this aspect of the policy, Japanese forces engaged in mass killings of both combatants and civilians. This involved indiscriminate violence against Chinese civilians in regions under Japanese control. Massacres, executions, and acts of violence were carried out to create an atmosphere of terror and to weaken the resolve of the Chinese populace. The Burn All Policy Japanese forces systematically set fire to villages, towns, and infrastructure in regions where they operated. This destruction aimed to deprive Chinese guerrilla forces of resources, make it difficult for them to sustain operations, and cause significant hardship to the civilian population. The widespread arson resulted in the displacement of many people and contributed to the overall devastation. The Loot All Policy This policy entails all Japanese forces engaged in looting and plundering of resources, goods, and valuables from Chinese communities. This not only served as a way to sustain their troops, but also inflicted economic hardship on the local population. The looting further disrupted the daily lives of civilians and added to the overall suffering caused by the war. With strict orders to kill all captives, the Japanese Imperial Army went through all atrocities anyone can ever imagine, from pillaging to raping all the female Chinese captives. They went as far as bayonetting babies and shooting elderly men. Two Japanese soldiers, namely Toshiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda, who were part of the Imperial Japanese Army's 16th Division, engaged in a macabre contest to see who could kill a designated number of Chinese people, first using a sword. This event is often referred to as the contest to kill 100 people using a sword. In this disturbing competition, 
Mukai and Noda reportedly went on a spree of violence, targeting Chinese civilians who were often defenseless and unarmed. They would approach their victims, sometimes in groups, and mercilessly slaughter them using their swords. The goal of reaching a certain number of kills turned the act of murder into a gruesome game for them. It's important to note that the numbers they claim to have reached have been contested, but their brutal actions remain widely acknowledged. Approximately 20,000 to 80,000 women experienced rape or sexual assault, followed by acts of mutilation or death. The perpetrators systematically went from house to house, forcibly dragging out women of all ages, even young children. Pregnant women faced the horrifying act of being cut open, while other victims suffered the unspeakable cruelty of being subjected to violence, such as a bayonet or bamboo stick penetration, until their demise. As news of the atrocities spread, international outrage and condemnation grew. Diplomats, missionaries, and journalists who witnessed the horrors in Nanking reported on the brutality. The Japanese government faced significant pressure from the international community. In response, they eventually ordered an investigation into the situation led by Prince Asaka Yasuhiko, who was also the commander of the Japanese forces in Nanking. By early 1938, as the investigation was ongoing and international pressure increased, the Japanese military began to control and suppress some of the violence. The formal end of the intense phase of the massacre can be marked around March 1938, when Japanese authorities took steps to regain control over their troops and curb some of the more flagrant acts of brutality. Japanese forces eventually withdrew from Nanking later in 1938, though the larger war would continue until Japan's surrender in 1945. The International Military Tribunal for the Far East, commonly known as the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal, was established after World War II to prosecute individuals responsible for war crimes committed during the conflict, including the Nanking Massacre. The tribunal took place from May 3, 1946 to November 12, 1948 in Tokyo, Japan. The Nanking incident was one of the many atrocities addressed during the tribunal, and individuals involved in the event were among those prosecuted for their roles. It aimed to hold accountable those who had committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other egregious acts during the war. Some of the notable figures who were prosecuted in the Nanking incident and other war crimes were as follows. Iwani Matsui. A general in the Japanese Imperial Army, Iwani Matsui was the overall commander during the Nanking incident. He was held responsible for the actions of his troops and was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Matsui was sentenced to death and executed in 1948. Akira Muto, a lieutenant general also responsible for the occupation of Nanking. Muto was also found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity and was sentenced to death. He was executed in 1948. Hitaro Kimura, Hitaro Kimura, also a lieutenant general, was implicated for his role as a division commander and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Tani Hisao, a major general, was also responsible for the occupation of the city and was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. He was sentenced to death and executed in 1948. Numerous other Japanese officers and officials were prosecuted for their roles in the Nanking incident and other atrocities. Some were found guilty, while others were acquitted or received lesser sentences. Chinese, American author, and journalist Iris Chang published a book in 1997 called The Rape of Nanking, which documented the horrific event and drew international attention to the massacre and shed light on the extent of the brutality and suffering endured by the Chinese population during that time. Japanese veterans and some conservative nationalist groups disputed Chang's account of the events, arguing that the death toll which he pointed out was up to one million was exaggerated and that the atrocities were not as widespread as she described. These disputes highlighted the ongoing complexities surrounding historical interpretation and memory, especially about wartime events and their portrayal in different countries. Tragically, Iris Chang struggled with mental health issues and faced criticism and harassment related to her work on the Nanking Massacre. She sadly took her own life in 2004. 
Despite the controversy and criticism, her book remains an important contribution to understanding the Nanking Incident and its historical significance, as well as the challenges of discussing wartime atrocities and their impact on international relations. While interpretations and narratives may vary, it remains crucial to seek the truth through rigorous historical research and a commitment to learning from the past. Remembering the Nanking Massacre is not just about memorializing the victims, but also about striving for a world where such atrocities are never repeated. Acknowledging the painful realities of history can contribute to a more empathetic and informed global society that works towards preventing violence and promoting human rights for all.